Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're gonna to talk about the design process that went into the Iowa class battleships and some of the preliminary design ideas. We're standing in the barbette for turret number two right now because it turned out that the barbettes were probably the biggest sticking point in the whole design. We'll come back to that later on. A visitor recently asked me, oh, well, who's the designer of these ships? And uh, off the top of my head, I could not name one person who was uh, important or instrumental in the design of Iowa class battleships. Um, and since these YouTube videos are basically a video blog about what I've learned on any given day, um, I immediately set about researching because we know that Navy ships are designed by teams. Uh, and in the US Navy, those teams are part of bureaus, uh, the Bureau of Construction and Repair or so-and-so during World War II at least. Uh, so I started looking through it and uh, the design process in general and what the various designs were. And uh, so to start from the beginning, the Iowa class design grows out of two things. The previous South Dakota class design, which the Navy was very happy with, and rightly so. Uh, the South Dakota class is arguably the best treaty battleship in the world. The other side of that is needing to grow beyond the 35,000 ton treaty battleship. When Japan refused to sign the second London Naval Treaty, the United States, Great Britain, and France got together and discussed introducing an escalator clause to the treaty. This escalator clause would allow them to build ships up to 10,000 tons heavier because their intelligence networks at the time said that the Japanese were not signing the treaties so that they could build a battleship around 45,000 tons with probably nine 16-inch guns. Uh, obviously, the Western powers were way off in that assessment, but it brought them together to talk about what their future battleships would look like if Japan did not sign the treaties. Uh, and so they decided that adding an extra 10,000 tons so that they could build their ships to 45,000 tons with a 16 inch main battery, uh, they would be able to keep pace with the parties that hadn't signed the treaty. So uh, in mid 1937, the deadline to sign the treaty passes, the escalator clause is invoked, so the US Navy starts looking at what the successor to the South Dakota class will be. What are they gonna buy for their 10,000 tons? There are two competing uh, design styles at this phase. One is a fast battleship, and the other one is a more heavily armed battleship. The more heavily armed battleship, which usually features 12 16 inch guns, but sometimes features 18 inch guns because the US Navy had tested an 18 inch 48 caliber gun uh, and did still have it at the Dahlgren Proving Grounds at the time. Uh, so that design evolution works its way up to uh, what will eventually become the Montana class. The other design faction wanted a fast battleship. The US Navy had never had a fast capital ship uh, and they were worried about both the Japanese battle cruisers of the Congo class and the Japanese Type A eight inch armed uh, heavy cruisers, their treaty cruisers. So the um, US Navy design teams decided that uh, the fast battleship design was more important. So that's where they were gonna start. And then they would come back to the slower design later on. As we all know, the slow design, um, eventually when World War II starts, no longer is restricted by the treaty. So it continues to grow until it's significantly larger than the 45,000 tons that the Iowas were designed to be. And because of that, this design originally called BB-65, later BB-67, the Montana class, ends up not uh, being built at all because it's such a huge investment in resources uh, and um, 
not only in building these 65,000 ton vessels themselves, but also in needing to build shipyards and dry docks and uh, Panama Canal locks that can accommodate a ship that size. So uh, your battleship grows too large, suddenly it can't be built anymore. So fortunately, the Iowa class is held to the escalator clause. So the very first design in the Iowa class evolution uh, really has nothing to do with the preceding South Dakota class. This is uh, termed an eight inch armored cruiser killer. Uh, this design originally has 12 16 inch guns. Uh, it's nearly a thousand feet long. It's designed to go 35 and a half knots with 285,000 shaft horsepower. So this is going to be a big, fast ship. The problem is it is only armored against eight inch gun cruisers. It's only armed against an eight inch shell. So a similar level of armor to somewhere around the Alaska class large cruisers or the Des Moines class heavy cruisers. A hardly fitting for a battleship, which is kind of a problem uh, when you look at this design, which ended up growing to 51,000 tons. It would have been very effective at hunting down Japanese cruisers and battle cruisers, but suffered from the same fatal flaw as earlier uh, battle cruiser designs, which the US Navy had never completed. And so they, they weren't entirely sure uh, what all the drawbacks were. Unfortunately, this design uh, moves into another set in early 1938. The driving forces here are Admiral Thomas Hart, who is the chairman of the general board, and Captain A.J. Chantry. Captain Chantry is the head of the preliminary design bureau uh, or the preliminary design board and is the driving force behind all of these preliminary designs that eventually become the Iowa class battleships. So if I was asked again in the future, who was the driving force behind designing the Iowa class? It's Captain A.J. Chantry. He's the guy who's giving the direction on where these different designs are gonna go. They decide to look at modifying the eight inch armored design to have the same protection as the previous South Dakota class battleships, i.e. have protection against the 16 inch 45 caliber gun. To do this, they remove one of the gun turrets and they add that level of armor. But the design is still above 50,000 tons and therefore too large to be workable. So they completely scrap that entire design lineage which sort of comes up out of nowhere. It's not derived from the South Dakota class or the Montana class or anything else. It is its own separate design branch. Uh, there ends up being four designs, the eight inch uh, cruiser armored one, and then designs A, B, and C, which are just variations on uh, armoring this ship. In some instances, they've got the five inch 38 as a dual purpose gun. In some instances, they have the six inch 53, which was supposed to be a dual purpose automatic gun. Uh, that doesn't end up being deployed until 1947 with the Worcester class cruisers, has all sorts of design problems. But at this stage, it still looks like this great war winning weapon. Uh, and so uh, many of these preliminary designs feature, uh, we could have 10 five inch 38s or we could have six uh, twin mounts of these uh, six inch 53s. Those designs are just not working. So Chantry decides to go back to the South Dakota class and instead of starting with a large ship and trying to shrink it down to 45,000 tons, which means shrinking down calculations for structural members and other things like that, which just wasn't getting them anywhere, he's going to start with the South Dakota class and stretch it over 800 feet to be able to get the speed he wants. And he finds that for around 40,000 uh, tons, with 220,000 horsepower, they can stretch a South Dakota class battleship uh, to be a 33 knot ship. And uh, this is extremely exciting, but other people on the design board are looking at this and going, hey, we've got 10,000 tons to work with and all you're doing is buying six knots of extra speed. So they start looking at changing the main battery gun to be more powerful. There are six different options that they look at here. These are characteristics for new turrets looked at in April of 1938. Uh, the first characteristic 
is just what if we use the 16 inch 45 from the South Dakota? It's a proven design, it already equips two classes of battleships. I'm sure it'll be great, but it doesn't offer anything more for this extra 10,000 ton. Next up, they look at a 16 inch 50 caliber Mark II gun. These had been built for the 1922 South Dakota and Lexington classes, which were canceled under the Washington Naval Treaty, but the guns still existed. They had been loaned to the army to use in coastal fortifications. So if you take this old style gun, it is in theory more powerful than the shorter uh, guns of these modern ships, but it's also much bigger. The original design looked at a 39 foot diameter barbette. This is too big to put in a ship that's gonna be limited by the Panama Canal's maximum width and still have an adequate torpedo defense. The next design looked at modifying the turret to be able to fit into a 37 foot diameter barbette. And that's what Iowa class battleships are eventually ended up with. Anything bigger than that simply wasn't going to fit inside a hull that can also fit through the Panama Canal and still have an adequate depth of torpedo protection. A fourth design looked at an entirely new Mark 7 16 inch 50 caliber gun barrel. Uh, this new gun barrel would be significantly lighter than the Mark II, but it hadn't even been designed yet. So development had to start from the ground up. Another design looked at an interchangeable slide, which could take either the Mark II or the yet to be developed Mark VII. And a sixth design looked at shrinking the size of the turret so that there was only one shell deck and otherwise saving a lot of weight uh, to be able to fit this in the smallest possible weight for a ship. The problem is this, from this point on, the Bureau of Construction and Repair designing the hull of the ship walks away thinking they're building a ship with a 37 foot diameter barbette, because that's what they can fit. Meanwhile, the Bureau of Ordnance walks away believing that since we're building a ship with the Mark II guns, that they're going to need the 39 foot diameter barbette. At this point, another series of five designs are drawn. These designs all look very similar to what will become the Iowa class. There are minor variations in length and weight and other things as stuff is added uh, and subtracted. And, and they're, they're basically playing around with numbers in these designs to see which combination of armor and horsepower and size and whatnot is going to be most preferred. At this point, the two design bureaus come back together and realize that they have been designing things that will not make together. Captain Chantry's design cannot be expanded two feet for the larger barbette. And uh, there's a whole lot of issues in the design bureaus at this point with them infighting about where, where the communication breakdown was. Uh, and at the end of the day, the Bureau of Construction uh, basically forces the Bureau of Weapons to go back to the drawing board and design an entirely new Mark VII gun turret and gun barrel. Uh, at the end of the day, this ended up being arguably the best battleship gun ever built. And it's a real miracle that they were able to scramble to make it work with the existing design. Uh, from this point on, you've got uh, pretty much the final design. It's authorized to the New York and Philadelphia Navy Yards. The New York Navy Yard will take the lead. And at this point, uh, with the war already begun in Europe, they realize that they've, they're no longer limited to the 45,000 tons they had already started with, and they're able to add some new stuff. These ships originally were gonna have four engineering main spaces like the earlier classes of American fast battleship. But because of the massive horsepower, 212,000 at the end of the design process, they realized that that would make uh, engine rooms over 60 feet wide, which meant a single torpedo hit on a bulkhead between the two uh, could flood 120 feet of the ship and that would be catastrophic. Uh, so they work into the design separate engine and boiler rooms, uh, which is what the Iowa class eventually ends up with, eight separate engineering main spaces instead of four. The final major addition at this point is also an addition to the reserve of buoyancy. Originally, the designs called for an armored citadel around the turrets and engineering spaces and a separate armored box all the way back aft around the steering gear. With extra weight to play with, the Navy chose to add 
uh, an extension to that armored box from the aft armored bulkhead all the way to the steering gear, which basically encloses uh, a lot of the dry stores and refrigeration plants under the mess decks back aft. This extends the armored part of the ship, allowing for more reserve of buoyancy to be retained in the event of damage. So that is the design process for what would eventually become the last American battleships and uh, arguably the best battleships ever designed. The basic through lines are pretty similar from beginning to end uh, with only some slight changes. Uh, it is amazing that these ships were built because they are so much of a departure from what the Navy uh, considered as the standard, which was supposed to be the Montana class design uh, that ended up not being built at all. So what do you think is the most important design feature of Iowa class battleships? Let us know in the comment section down below. Which of the things added do you think gave the most value for these ships? For 10,000 tons, six knots seems like not that much, but extra buoyancy over a South Dakota class battleship, extra margin for growth, which allowed these ships to serve for many years, uh, the slightly higher caliber main battery guns for extra range, uh, all of that uh, is worth consideration. Let us know in the comment section down below what you think was most important. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about our channel and the museum. Thanks for watching.